Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Shackman. Once it was the moon, but today Mars is the holy grail of space exploration. In the coming months, three missions, one from the U.S., one from Taiwan, and one from the United Arab Emirates, will be approaching and or landing on Mars. Next year, Russia, Japan, and India have missions planned. It could get pretty crowded up there. And while NASA, the President, and Congress may be less enamored by space than by the latest social media site, there is amazing work being done at NASA. And of course, the private sector, in the form of wayfarers such as Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, and Richard Branson, all of whom are giving the government some competition. All of this is part of the history of space and its future exploration, which also includes an amazing mission planned to Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, in 2024. Joining us today to give us a telescopic view of all of this is my guest, David W. Brown. David Brown is a freelance writer whose nonfiction appears frequently in The Atlantic, The New York Times, The New Yorker, Scientific America, and Foreign Policy. He's an Antarctic explorer, an endurance runner, a former Army paratrooper, and a veteran of the Afghan War. His new book is entitled The Mission, A True Story, and it is my pleasure to welcome David Brown to the program. David, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you here. Why is it, do you think, that our fascination with space has waned so much since the 1969 Apollo mission? One of the interesting things that I don't think people realize is that even during the Apollo mission, people weren't all that enamored by space. In fact, uh, Neil Armstrong had, had been on the moon for a couple of days, and public opinion polls showed support for NASA going down. The first question people had is, what are we doing up there? Like, why are we spending all this money? Um, In general, I would say, uh, people have an impoverished understanding of how much money NASA gets. I think people think NASA gets like 30% of the federal budget. In fact, uh, NASA gets one half of 1% of the federal budget. And for things like exploration, it gets a quarter of that little amount. So Americans spend more every year on chewable dog toys than they do on (laughs) space exploration. But of course, back during that period, the period of Apollo, a lot larger percentage of of the budget was being spent on NASA. Right. Even then, it was was something like 2%, which is is a non-trivial amount of money relative to the average American's life. But when we look at sort of the, the dividends that have been paid to us because of that exploration, because of that fundamental research and engineering, um, we're getting that uh, in spades. I think one reason why people are, are less enamored overall if you know, by NASA than they might have been during the moon landing is simply because what an incredible spectacle and human achievement that was. It was the greatest engineering achievement in the history of humankind. So it's easy to, you know, it's a lot easier to say, well, that's that's worth it for the for the human for the human adventure. Um, today, we don't really have that. We 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 the International Space Station, although one of the finest human achievements since the building of the Great Pyramids, is not quite the same as walking on the moon. To what extent does it also have to do with leadership? We really haven't had presidential leadership or leadership anywhere, really, in terms of of electeds that were enthusiastic about this since Lyndon Johnson. You are exactly correct. And and, um, one of the problems politicians face, I am not one to sympathize with politicians ever, but um, one problem they do face is there is no political gain from supporting space exploration. Historically, um, you can lose elections by spending too much time talking about space, but you're not going to win any. And and, uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson served one term. Um, Obviously, President Kennedy tragically could not complete his term. But but even then, in in that that era of the 60s, um, space exploration was sort of a fig leaf around the development of rockets that, that launch intercontinental ballistic missiles for our Cold War with Russia. Um, that that threat is gone today, and consequently, politically, there's just nothing to be gained by saying, let's go to Mars. How much of it has to do with, and you talk a lot about this in the mission, in this age of instant gratification, the timeline for these missions is so, so long between the conception and the reality that, that people lose interest in this day and age? That's a really good question. And, and, and the, the pro, the, the, one of the things that, that 
has motivated me over the the seven years that it took to write this book was something that happened after the New Horizons flyby of Pluto. So for for most of our lives, um, we had no idea what Pluto looked like. It was just you know we just had artists' imagine imaginings of what it might look like, but we didn't know really what it looked like the way we know what, uh, for example, Saturn looks like. And um, I covered that flyby. Um, I, 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 I reported from the place where, from the sort of the mission control where they were where they were running it. And when I got home the next day, um, I was talking to a dear friend, and and she said, well, "Why why did they even do that? Like I thought Pluto wasn't a planet anymore." She was under the the mistaken assumption that NASA, on a whim, said, "Ah, oh, let's do this mission, let's launch <laughs> this thing, and and let's do it." She had no idea that it takes nine and a half years to get to Pluto with a spacecraft flying 54,000 miles per hour. And even before that, that launch nine and a half years earlier, it, you know, decades of effort went into that. So the, although we saw Pluto in 2015 for the first time, that mission started in the 1980s. So it was an ex- extreme long-term project. And if you're a planetary scientist, particularly one who, whose interests are the outer planets of the solar system, anything beyond the asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, uh, uh, the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, Pluto, and so on, um, there's a good chance you're going to spend your entire career trying to get a mission going because you've got to get politicians involved, like interested. You've got to get Congress interested. You've got to get NASA headquarters interested. You've got to get the scientific community interested. And only then – And you have to get all those people interested at the same time because they're always changing. And only then can a mission begin. And that's what the the book that I've written, The Mission, is about. It's about how incredibly difficult it is and how how many heartbreaks you get along the way and how many people die, you know, just of of old age starting these missions but never actually seeing them get approved, let alone get launched and get data back from, from those worlds. The other part of that, if you carry it out further, is that there isn't that kind of institutional knowledge that travels along, because by two missions from whatever the current mission is, all those people are gone. Yes, and that's a huge problem that NASA faces right now. So a lot of people are wondering, why in the world is it taking us so long to go back to the moon, right? Because... Because that is NASA's stated goal right now with the Artemis program. We want to put the first woman on the moon, which is a which is a worthy goal. The problem is everybody who put people on the moon the first time are dead. So and, and it's not like there's blueprints sitting in filing cabinets. These these programs are enormous, spread across hundreds of companies, most of which are out of business. And and there might be an entire company, an entire warehouse you know, spun up, a factory built to build one tiny little part in a machine that has a million parts. So it's, it's, it is ever a, um, it's ever a challenge to sort of keep those things going. That's one argument against returning to the moon. We, we, um, Americans haven't landed anything on the moon since Apollo 17 in, the, in like 1972. Well, but there is a place in the solar system that we are great at landing things, and that's Mars. So there, there's a strong argument to be made to say, well, we know how to do Mars. We're great at doing Mars. Everyone who's alive is doing Mars, or everyone doing Mars right now is still alive. Let's put astronauts there while we know how to do it, before we forget how to do it. And and the other part of it is when you talk about these missions and how long they are and how complex they are and how many people are involved, so many of the decisions that get made along the way are decisions that get made, if you'll pardon the pun, on the fly, and it's not all documented. Right. So one of the, one, especially in terms of engineering. So uh, you talked earlier about institutional knowledge. Uh, a great many interesting problems are solved not necessarily in in uh, you know uh, an engineering piece of software, but solved over coffee, like you know two people meeting in the break room talking about this problem they're having and having that eureka moment or that aha, let's try this. Um, and you, you lose a lot of that when there's an institutional uh, when there's an institutional uh, uh, pause or breakdown because of because of timing or or or, or um, duration of these missions. 
One of the other aspects that seems to run through this, and some of it, go, I mean, it goes all the way back to Apollo, and, and it's wrapped up in our celebrity culture, I suppose, in some respects, is the degree to which some of this stuff is engineering-led versus astronaut-led, and the degree to which that makes a difference. Mm, yes. So one problem that planetary exploration has had historically, planetary exploration being robotic exploration, right? Um, and this is something that I write extensively about in the mission. Um, one problem that, that, that robotic-led exploration has encountered is NASA is not first and foremost a science organization. The S in NASA does not stand for science. As, uh, NASA is first and foremost an astronaut-led organization. Its job is to put people in space. Um, it just so happens that in the last, particularly the last, say, 25 years, NASA has, technology and NASA's abilities to robotically explore these worlds has reached a sort of critical mass. They can do anything now, it seems like, and they can do it in very graceful and elegant ways. When we, so in a couple of weeks, the Perseverance rover is going to land on Mars. This is a one-ton rover. It, we're landing a nuclear-powered car on Mars. How crazy is that? That's science fiction, but that's what we're doing right now. Likewise, when we look at rocketry, rockets are landing vertically. And that, that's Looney Tunes cartoons from when I was a kid, and that's just normal now. Kids today don't even think that's interesting. It's just how it's done, right? But no, that was never how it's done. So th there's always going to be a, a greater appreciation by the public for big human-led or, or human missions, um, the moon program, as we discussed earlier, that there's going to be a lot of interest in the International Space Station. For example, if we return to the moon, that's going to get a phenomenal, phenomenal amount of support relative to what it gets now. Like I said, I, I, I would be stunned if it got like truly um, critical mass support. But robotic missions have a much harder time early in the game getting that kind of support from the public. Once we start getting those images from Mars, once we start getting those images of Pluto, in the case of the mission, once we start getting those th th those images and data of Europa and understanding the, the ocean beneath that ice, right? So there's three times more liquid salt water on Europa than there is on planet Earth, right? And like real salt water. You could stick a cup in that water, drink it, and it wouldn't be healthy for you, but your body would know what to do with it. And And... Those sorts of missions just have a harder time getting broad public support early on. What role does science fiction and popular culture play in shaping all this? It is impossible to overstate the importance for science fiction and, and, um, and pop culture. It's impossible to overstate their importance, particularly when we look at the, the engineers, the men and women who are actually doing this work. Um, one of the things that struck me while I was researching the mission um, and I interviewed over 100 people for this book, so I, I feel like I have a fairly good sample to work from here. I bet every conversation I had, the words Star Trek came up at least one point. And not like casual Star Trek fan, but, but serious, like, remember in episode three of the third season, that sort of thing. Likewise, things like Star Wars also keep space in the public eye. I think what people want... Um, at a very fundamental level, the human race loves the idea of adventure and we love storytelling. And it just so happens that, you know, we love the frontier and it just so happens that space has all of those things. There's a certain impatience, I think, and it's an understandable impatience. We want, you know, we want the Starship Enterprise out there exploring strange new worlds and seeking out new life forms and new civilization. But um, we want it now. And that goes back to what you'd said earlier about about immediate gratification. This is not a this is not a business for people who want immediate gratification. It's it's very incremental steps because in space, particularly space with hum, involving human exploration, you know, one mistake is not a bad day. It's a it's a catastrophe. It's a, it's a tragedy. The other side of that, though, with respect to science fiction is that because the reality is so much slower, as we talked about before, that these missions take so long, that, that generally they happen in incremental steps in terms of the science and, and the way they go forward, that none of it can live up to 
the expectations of, of science fiction and popular culture, and therefore will always disappoint. Hmm. Well, I would say that is correct to an extent. Obviously, I mean, we don't we don't have lightsabers and uh, <laughs> and and phasers to to fight the Klingons, but but I do think um, I do think people bring some sophistication to the table, and and and, and an example I'll give is. Uh, the, for example, the SpaceX's launch of Elon Musk's um, Tesla a couple of years ago. There was nothing particularly amazing about that in and of itself. It was simply you, normally they would they would have launched you know a solid solid block of just anything just to test the the the, the payload uh, capabilities. Um, but launching something fairly low tech, a car right in space, but giving it a little style, a little panache. I think that went a, I think I think that went a long way. Um, so I think it, it 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 it's not that it can't live up to the the wonder of these things. I think it's more how the wonder is being presented because it is all wonderful. It is all extraordinary. It is all stunning. It's hard to get super excited about Martian geography, but I think it's really easy to get excited about what it took to land things on Mars, for example. So I don't think we're going to see on, on, on the, you know, although we won't see anything because of the pandemic, but we won't see on the screens in Times Square, you know, scientists talking about, look at this ridge on the, on the horizon of Mars. That, we don't really get excited about that anymore. But we would definitely see people losing their minds over how difficult and how incredible that landing system is. What do you make of, in this broader context of these missions, the privatization of some of this? I would say that the, the privatization of the launch industry, so SpaceX, um, um, Blue Origin, uh, Virgin Galactic, that will have probably the most consequential and uh, meaningful impact on space exploration of anything that we've seen since probably probably since the Apollo program. Um, the most difficult part financially, and well, the most difficult part we could say overall of space exploration, certainly the most expensive, is getting a widget from the planet Earth into space. Escaping our gravity is incredibly difficult, and it's incredibly expensive. And every ounce adds, you know, thousands of dollars. So by the time you're lifting a ton, you're spending, you know, Tens, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars to get this thing into space. By lowering the cost of access to space, um, suddenly all of that money is freed up for greater technology, for more sophisticated programs, for, um, for um, more interesting ways overall of doing business. You know, If you wanted to launch, uh, maybe you can't launch a Starship Enterprise, but if it's really cheap to launch multiple things into space, you can just launch the parts for the Enterprise and build it in orbit. Obviously, that's kind of a cheeky example, but you get the idea. Um, by removing the barrier that is uh, you know, eight or nine figures for launch in terms of the price tag, um, you enable people who would not otherwise have been able to get into the space business you enable them not only to get into it, but to thrive. Are you really reducing the cost? Are you just transferring the cost? I mean, ultimately, if it's a government mission, for example, they're paying SpaceX or, or you know, Virgin Galactic or any of these companies. Right, but if the if the well for for a long time there, it was you know NASA's building these rockets, and so if we look at the Space Launch System rocket, right, which is the super heavy lift rocket that they're building right now and that they hope to. Uh, launch for the first time this year. That's going to cost a billion dollars per launch. When we look at the Falcon Heavy rocket, that might be $150 million per launch. It's not really transferring the money. I mean, it's literally that much that much cheaper because they had a different way of development. Now, look, NASA along the way helped companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin. Make no mistake, uh, without NASA, these, these organizations wouldn't exist. They, the U.S. government certainly provided seed money for these companies to go. But it's not a matter of building one rocket and then building another rocket and then building another rocket. We're building, or these companies are building the one rocket and then launching it nine times. And suddenly, by virtue of the number of times you can launch these rockets, um, they don't need to charge as much money as would have costed if they had to build it from scratch every time. 
Talk about this mission coming up in 2024 to to Jupiter. So, um, and, and well, that's what the, the book that I've written, The Mission, um, it's about a small team of scientists, engineers who spent 20 years trying to convince NASA to fly this mission. It's a spacecraft to Europa, which is Jupiter's moon. Like I said, Europa matters because it has that liquid saltwater ocean, three times more water than the planet Earth. Um, as a result of this, as a result of the fact that um, the moon possesses also organics at, on its ocean floor, it has um, it has the chemical energy necessary um, for life. Um, it has these columns of hot water billowing into the into the into the sea itself, blasting nutrients into it. Um, and water is touching rock, where it's, which is how you get interest in chemistry. A result of all this is that. Europa is the most likely place in the solar system beyond Earth to harbor life, and not just single-celled organisms, but conceivably complex life, and maybe fish, maybe, maybe sea monsters. And to what extent is this mission sort of the beginning of something, or is it the end of something in terms of NASA's perception of it? That's, that's a great question. So when we look at the history of Mars exploration, I'll use that as an analog, um, or even lunar exploration, for that matter. There's a there's a seek there's a way that you explore that you always explore a new body. You explore it first with a flyby, then you explore it with an orbiter, then you explore it with a lander, then you explore it with a rover, and eventually you send astronauts. Well, astronauts are probably never going to go to Europa, certainly not in the next hundred years, and that's because Europa exists in what's called the the Jovian radiation belt. Um, it's it's a very inhospitable part of space. The conditions there are not unlike the immediate aftermath of a detonated thermonuclear bomb. So in the case of Europa, we've already had the flyby. That was with the, the spacecraft Voyager in, uh, in 1979. We've had an orbiter. That was the spacecraft, or, or we had an orbiter around Jupiter. That was the spacecraft Galileo. Um, this would be an orbiter element to that exploration sequence, um, the problem is it's impossible, or it's very difficult to orbit Europa. It's just too expensive because that radiation is too bad. And because of that radiation, the computers in these robots, um, you know, zeros get flipped to ones, and suddenly mm -hmm. the robot goes on a suicide mission and crashes into the world rather than looks at it, things like that. That's a bit, that's uh, being a little silly about it, but that's that's really how things work out. I mean, these things, these are computer, computer, uh, it's going to fry them. So rather than marinate in that in that radiation with a spacecraft, what you can do is orbit Jupiter multiple times and encounter Europa at different orientations. And over an extended period of time, each time the spacecraft flies by Europa in its orbit of Jupiter, it builds a new strip of that moon until finally you get a 360-degree view of Europa. The next step – so this, this mission is going to characterize the habitability of Europa – how could life exist here? Where could life exist here? Where's the place most likely to find that life? Where should we sort of scratch and sniff into that ice shell? The next mission, and part of a mission sequence, just as we've explored Mars sequentially and we've explored the moon sequentially and other bodies, uh, the next step would be to set a lander down on that surface and to saw into that ice 10 centimeters beneath the, ice, beneath the surface of the ice shell. You, you get through the irradiated surface, the part that's enduring the, the radioactive environment. And that's where you're going to be able to find evidence of things that wiggled or once wiggle. And you'll be able to um, answer once and for all the, the ultimate question, the question that would change life, I mean, that would change uh, religion, philosophy, biology, science, the question of does life exist elsewhere in the, in the, in the universe? And not only is it is it very likely to exist there? Um, it, it's going to exist, you know, two planets over on a weird moon circling a swirling ball of hydrogen in space. This is extraordinary. That means life isn't this rare, this rare cactus in a desert. I mean, life is a blade of grass in a meadow, and it's going to change our understanding of our place in the universe. What's to be made of, we talked about privatization before, the fact that other nations are now doing space exploration? It, it's, it's wonderful. It, that, that's, that's something that people should, should try to guard against, you know, feeling a sense of nativism or, or nationalism when it comes to space exploration. First of all, space is big, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, space is, is, is infinite. 
and when we talk about if we because we do this and this is an influence of science fiction right when we start thinking about mars for example or the moon you start thinking well we better get up there because china's up there and we don't want them to claim the whole moon i mean <laughs> claiming a claiming a body that you can't defend is meaningless first of all but 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 secondly people under 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 imagine just how enormous these bodies are i mean the moon is a quarter the size of earth and the earth is pretty darn large to begin with but if something the quarter the size of the earth i mean that's about that that's an awful lot of land mass um because there's no oceans taking up uh space on space on the moon likewise uh, likewise on mars um it, uh, it's uh, much bigger than the moon, obviously, and much smaller than the Earth. But again, it's an entire planet. There's plenty of space to go around. We should be very happy. It, we're also very fortunate that the scientific community um, tends to transcend borders. One thing that we saw during the Cold War, and I write about this in, in the mission, is although the superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, were pointing you know, doomsday devices at each other, Science, planetary scientists were regularly in communication, regularly um, exchanging information on this incredible science that they were doing. Whether it was the whether it was the United States and their work on on the Mar, on, on Mars and on the Moon, or the Soviet Union who was doing extraordinary work on on the planet Venus, they, they by by working together, they really established a sort of not backroom diplomacy. I mean, they weren't trying to change the world. They were just trying to do their jobs. And and science is something that has never um, has never been beholden to to nationalism. So so I'm enthusiastic about it. The more people we can, the more the more nations we can get at Mars and the Moon and Jupiter and anywhere else they might want to explore, the better. We should we should be encouraging it. And NASA does in fact work with these with these other. Um, agencies. We don't we don't do a whole lot of work with China. Um, that there's theirs tends to be a bit more secretive. But but um, but the rest of the world there's a there's a great engagement and and we're all the better for it. And when we talk about something like a space force, there's the fear that a lot of people have about militarization of space. That's a that's a very fair fear to have, and it's one that I'm hoping the Biden administration will will clarify culturally in the space force while it's still in its nascency. Um, Space Force is basically just a a command within the Air Force that's been renamed, right? So mostly what they do is is remote sensing. They're satellites in space scanning the Earth. Um, there's There's no cultural or political reason to have the Space Force aside from the last president decided at a rally that he wanted one, and, and, and now we have it, and we're sort of having to keep the charade going. But um, but it exists. It's probably not going away, which means we have to do the best we can with it. And what the best we can with it is probably going to be um, is making sure that it has a, a culture of peace. I mean, there is, there, there's a great value to having something like that. Remember, the Department of Defense gets extraordinary amounts of money. I mean, NASA's entire budget would be a rounding error in the Defense Department budget. You wouldn't even notice it if it disappeared. So if Space Force could get, say, Air Force money or even Marine Corps money, which would be much smaller but still way more than NASA gets, if it went, if, if it spent all of that money or a, percent, a large percent of that money on research and development work, building new thrusters, propulsion technologies, um, um, Computers, miniature, miniaturization of computers, greater uh, communications technologies, and so on and so forth. All of that stuff will eventually trickle down to NASA, and NASA will be able to basically outsource its R and D. And and there's no end of good that can come from that. So I'm hopeful that we begin to see the Space Force, or that the Biden administration makes sure that the Space Force is something more like the Army Corps of Engineers and less like, you know, Marine Corps shock troopers. And yet the irony of that is that it was the Cold War that really gave rise to so much of the impetus of things like Gemini and Apollo. Of course, that's that. You know, it's it, there's always been a, a contradiction at the heart of the space program. It exists specifically because we wanted to launch weapons of doom to other countries, and um, NASA has gone above and beyond to make sure that. It can stay above that fray. It's 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 often dragged down into it. Remember, we had shuttle astronauts using the space shuttle to launch 
spy satellites, for example, which was a bad thing, in my opinion, because it, 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 it diminished the international trust of NASA. Um, the space shuttle design itself was designed so that it could conceivably steal spy satellites from other countries in orbit. There's no evidence that that ever happened, but it was a, an early design decision. And one of the design decisions, incidentally, that led to the weird design that the shuttle had and consequently many of its vulnerabilities. I think you could probably, and I don't know if smarter people than I have have drawn this line yet, but you can undoubtedly draw a direct line from the tragedies that would result from the destructions of um, Challenger and Columbia to um, design, design decisions that were made to mollify the Defense Department. David W. Brown, his book is The Mission, A True Story. David, I thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you so much for having me today. It was such a pleasure. Thank you.